This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is the Deputy Athletic Director of the University of Memphis, Ren Baker. <laughs> Ren Baker is a full plate at the University of Memphis. As the right-hand man of AD Tom Bowen, he helps oversee advancement, development, stewardship, event marketing, the university's ticket office, and Tiger Sports Properties. Baker came to Memphis in February of this year after successful stints as athletic director at Northwest Missouri State and Rogers State. Baker is also working closely with the Tigers' nationally ranked men's basketball program and head coach Josh Pastner. Today on Sports Files, we'll introduce you to this hardworking individual who has helped bring new blood and a new perspective to Memphis Tigers athletics. We'll learn more about his job, his goals, and what he thinks about the 16th ranked Tigers hoop squad, plus an update on where things stand on the capital fundraising campaign for athletic facilities and how they were able to bring former Tigers hoop star Bill Laurie back into the fold and land a $10 million gift. Ren Baker, next on Sports Files. Ren, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Greg. It's always a pleasure to, to be with you and always a pleasure to have any opportunity to discuss Memphis Tiger athletics. Well, as I mentioned from the outset of our uh, broadcast tonight, you have a lot of things that you're associated with. You wear many hats over at the university. So for the folks out there, explain some of your responsibilities. Well, uh, when I was brought in, you know, Tom Bowen uh, wanted a couple of things. He wanted somebody who had been an athletic director so that you, he could uh, have somebody uh, that he could confide in and work through on decisions. So I serve in that capacity for Tom. And then on a day-to-day, -day, uh, uh, my role is uh, to oversee the external operations of our department. So I have the marketing uh, department, the development department, uh, Tiger Sports Properties, which does our uh, multimedia uh, rights, um, and then also the M Club uh, and Media Relations report up to me. So, uh, yeah, it, you know, there's a lot, lot there, but, uh, you know, I, I'm very happy to, to be in that role and that capacity and work with a lot of good people every day. You've almost completed a year. February will be a full year for you. What's the biggest challenge that you face? You know, I think um, just coming in at a time when uh, the landscape of college athletics is, is changing so much and so uh, trying to, to compete in a new conference and, uh, and make sure that we are keeping our basketball program at a high level, uh, rebuilding our football program and getting it at a competitive level, trying to build facilities and raise money. I, I think we have a lot of irons in the fire at once and so, um, you know, that part of it's challenging. Uh, but it, but it's also fun, and I, I have found uh, that environments where there's a lot of, of challenges going on works better for me, mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of people are that way. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that uh, it's a good time to be at Memphis. Good things are happening. What are the big differences between what you did at the smaller schools and now here at the University of Memphis? Is it strictly just a, a difference monetarily, or are there other differences? I think maybe the biggest overall difference is the pace. Uh, you know, that we... Uh, things come very, very quick at this level. Whereas Division uh, Two, uh, even though the Division Two program I, I was at um, had tremendous interest and we played at a high level, and um, I think that the the pace in which that things come at you and fly at you is a little bit uh, easier to deal with. Here, it, it seems like you're always. Uh, it's like uh, my old uh, basketball coach in junior high said, you're never in position defensively, mm -hmm. you're always trying to get there. And so that's kind of the way I feel sometimes. I don't think we ever get to where we need to be. We're just fighting to get there. But, um, you know, I think the pace has, has, has been probably the biggest uh, difference from, from where I was at. But the bottom line is the bottom line, winning programs, making money if it's possible. That's exactly right. And, and uh, you know, winning covers up a lot of things. Uh, uh, to your fan base and uh, and our you know our fan base has been very supportive and uh, you know we are finding as we embark on a very ambitious capital campaign that that support is there and that the loyalty is there and that people feel very strong about their support and affinity to the University of Memphis. All right, you mentioned the capital campaign. Tell everybody what you're trying to do, what you're trying to raise, 
and obviously we're going to talk about the facilities that you're going to try to construct. Um, in total, we want to raise a true $40 million for brick and mortar projects. Um, every year we raise in excess of $10 million, sometimes $12 million, uh, for a variety of things, including scholarship and, and those things. But uh, we really want to raise $40 million uh, just to do a bricks and mortar projects. And those projects would include an indoor football practice facility, um, a new men's basketball practice facility, um, some improvements at our baseball facility, continued improvements at uh, the track and field slash soccer complex um, that, uh, that will be named after uh, the Harden uh, Trust and what the, what the Harden family has done out there. And so um, those are all projects that will be part of it. And probably a few more before we're done will somehow find their way into it. But I, I think it will give us comprehensively some of the best uh, facilities in the country for across a broad section of sports and allow us to build an athletic department that competes in, uh, at a high level in everything that we do. You're off to a great start as Bill and Nancy Laurie, of course, Bill, a former Memphis State great basketball player, gave $10 million. That's, that's the way to get it kick started. How were you able to get the Lorries back in the fold? Because they had been pretty much apart from the university for many years. You know, I think that Bill and Nancy's hearts have always uh, been in Memphis. And, you know, they, they have so many business interests and other things going on uh, in their life. And, um, you know, we didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about um, the many years that has, has uh, passed since they were last here on campus and spent a lot of time. Um, you know, we just had a chance to, to visit uh, with Bill uh, in Detroit last year at the NCAA tournament and then uh, uh, had a chance to go out and uh, visit with he and Nancy in their home uh, in LA a couple of times and, and Paige, their daughter. And um, what we found is that Bill and Nancy uh, both care very deeply uh, about the University of Memphis, uh, both athletics and academics. And um, as we shared a vision and a plan for what we wanna do uh, to take uh, Memphis athletics to the next level, uh, you know, Bill and Nancy both uh, were adamant that they wanted to be a part of it. And so, um, you know, I don't know that it's any, uh, anything special that, um, that any one person has done. I think they had great confidence in Tom Bowen. I think mm -hmm. they had great confidence in Brad Martin. Brad Martin was very key and integral to that process. But most of all, I think they have great love and affinity for the University of Memphis, for the city of Memphis, and for the way they embrace Bill here as a, as a player, the way they embrace that 73 team. Um, and the way that uh, they continue to love and embrace uh, the University of Memphis. Ren, what is the timeline for construction of these facilities? Obviously, you have to have the money first, but what is the projection? Well, we set a, a very aggressive and very ambitious goal of trying to raise the money uh, by June. Um, and President Martin has kind of uh, led that timeline because that's when he transitions out as president. He really wants to see us uh, at or near goal before he transitions out. Um, now. Uh, when I say that that's a very uh, ambitious goal, I mean, it, he knows that it is and we know that it is, but we do believe over the course of the next year that, that we can uh, hit that goal. And as we get closer and closer to that goal, I don't know that we have a number in mind, but there will be a period of time where we would go ahead and proceed with financing and, uh, and, and, and groundbreaking. And uh, there is an opportunity for, for pledges to come in over a period of five years or so. Uh, and so we'd get a short-term loan to go ahead and build the facility and let the pledges come in. But, you know, this is not a, a uh, dream that we have to do something uh, five, six years from now. I mean, we want to make it happen right. in the next couple of years. And so to do that, there's some very aggressive goals uh, for getting the money in. But, you know, what we're finding is a very supportive fan base and, and 40 million is a lot of money. Um, it's a lot of money for any institution anywhere. But I really believe that um, our time is now. I mean, we are on an, on an apex of a critical time, not only for the University of Memphis, but just uh, college athletics in general. There's a lot of things happen nationally, a lot of things behind the scenes. And so it's never been more important than it is now to invest uh, in making sure you have a quality uh, athletic program. And that goes beyond facilities, a quality student athlete experience, a quality academic support system, and, and a quality university and so I think that a lot of a lot of positive things are coming together for us all at one time. Can you expound on that just a, a little bit more about why it's so important now with the changing landscape? 
Well, uh, you know, I don't think it's any secret that there's been a lot of talk. Um, now it's it's calmed a little bit about the uh, the breakaway. The breakaway, mm -hmm. and um, will that happen? Uh, I think that not entirely will there be a separated breakaway because I think the big boys know uh, that. And I can, you know, I consider us a, a, a big boy. You know, that's where we want to be. It's where we aspire to be. They know that uh, that is going to be a very intensive process. Um, and, uh, you know, even something so small as is there a minimum number of sports sponsorships. And, I, you know, Bubba Cunningham at North Carolina is a good friend of mine. He was quoting an article saying, if there's a new division, we think there should be a minimum number of sports because Carolina – uh, we sponsor 27 sports, and the University of Texas sponsors 17, and they have more money than anybody. And, right. You know, and that, and so um, something as little as that, because you could spend two years arguing that. I mean, when you get presidents and ADs and those people in a room, they all are very strong-willed. They're all leaders on their campus. Mm -hmm. They all have an opinion. So I think they know that 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 undertaking would be massive. And so I really think that uh, what you'll see is them stay under the NCAA umbrella, but uh, that there'll be a different set of, of uh, rules and, and circumstances. And, and, you know, whatever happens there, we want to make sure that the University of Memphis is poised to compete at the highest level, whatever that is. And I don't think any of us have the answer for what that's going to look like. If we did, uh, we'd be the highest paid uh, <laughs> athletic administrators in the country because everybody wants the answer. But I do think that it's our, our charge and our goal to make sure whatever that looks like, that the University of Memphis is a part of it. Obviously, you work with very closely with all the sports. You work very closely with Josh Pastor and the basketball team. I want to get to them in a second. That's, that's the positive. The negative still is the development of this football program. First thing Tom Bowen talked about when he arrived here, to get the football program to that level of respectability where they're competing each and every Saturday. Things looked good early in the season. It kind of waned at the end. And... The Tigers lost those last two games by being outscored uh, big time, mm -hmm. uh, losing to teams that were struggling in Temple and Connecticut. Where do you think we stand right now with football and two years into the Justin Fuente era? You know, this is what I've learned in college athletics, and we've seen this recently with basketball in Oklahoma State. Uh, things, is ne they're never as bad as they seem, and they're never as good as they seem. Um, I think that our football program is not very far off, and I believe in Justin Fuente, I believe in his staff, I believe in what they're doing, I believe in what they're trying to do. Um, I think that uh, you look at uh, the three best teams in our conference, Cincinnati, Central Florida, um, and Louisville, Louisville mm -hmm. and we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with right. all three of them. Uh, right. And one of them on the road, uh, one, you know, Central Florida who ended up uh, going to BCS Bowl, we had beat. and you know, I, I think if young people now, uh, th there's a guy named Tim Elmore that studies the young generation. He says today's 18-year-old was the 14-year-old of 20 years ago in terms of what they're equipped to deal with, hmm. you know, and the maturity level that they possess. Right. Part of it is the whole helicopter parenting thing that's happened for years and years, and we saw problems for our kids, and kids don't grow up with, with the ability always to handle adversity. So if you go back in time and we get a stop on 4th and 20-something at Middle Tennessee, um, or we don't get a pass interference call on that last play and we win that game, or if the Central Florida game goes a little different, I think all of a sudden that has an effect at the end of the year. But there, com but there comes a time when you're telling young people, if you do A, B, and C, uh, this is the result. And if they don't see that result, it becomes harder and sure. harder to keep them motivated, especially towards the end of the year. So to, to, to wrap that up, I really don't think we're very far off. I think we return, I know we return 16 of 22 starters. We played 23 freshmen. We had a lot of kids red shirting. Uh, our coaches are out recruiting right now. And I would be, uh, I'd be sh really shocked if we didn't become bowl eligible next season. Okay. I know that's a, I know that's a big prediction. I'm an optimist. I'm the first to say and that. Double but your I, win total I from, believe from this it. year. Yeah. So you feel very good that the state of the football team now, as opposed to two years ago, is a lot better off. And I think most of us can see that. All right, let me make the transition to basketball. And uh, Billy Joel once sang a song where he mentioned sadness and euphoria, and you've seen that so far because you were in <laughs> Stillwater, and it was sadness. Here's the nationally ranked Tigers getting clobbered by Oklahoma State. And then the euphoria of going down to Orlando, winning three, the rematch game with Oklahoma State, where you look like a completely different team. 
Don't give me the company line. How good is this basketball team? How good can they be at the end of the year? I think when they're cut in and they're focused and they're, and they're selfless in their team, uh, they're one of the 15 to 20 best teams in the country. Um, and, I, you know, I really believe that. Now, you get to the postseason, you got to get a lucky draw, a friendly bounce. I mean, we've seen sure. that. I watched the story on ESPN last night on the 83 North Carolina State team and how many games that they won just that they had no business winning over the course of the year to win that national championship. Um, got to catch some breaks. You do have to catch some breaks. But I do believe with the way that our posts are playing, I mean, they're athletic, they're quick, they're agile. I mean, Austin and Shaq are, you know, they just are so skilled. Uh, for for guys their size and then our guards are starting to play better um, you know I think that we have a chance to be really really good I think Josh and his staff have done a great job of taking that Oklahoma State team that Oklahoma State game where we had so many things exposed and addressing almost every one of those weaknesses and you know those games I personally felt guilty because I haven't worked at Oklahoma State four years in the basketball program for Eddie Sutton I knew right. what we were walking I into. I know you have um, and so I knew that it was going to be a tough, tough contest. Now, I thought we would play a little better than we did, uh, but I felt guilty. I apologized to Josh. I said, you know, I'm sorry because I know what it's like to play there. Um, but, you know, he told me then, and he's reiterated it since, don't apologize because we needed to get exposed. We needed to see that uh, so that we can focus on getting better as a team, and they've done that. And I think they got a chance to be very, very good. All right, give me, give me a quick answer, if you have a quick answer, to, to this question. You mentioned earlier, UCF, in the final year of the BCS, gets to play in the Fiesta Bowl as the representative from the American. How is the money split up, and what type of a, of a check are you guys going to get? You know, Tom Bowen would be a better person to ask that question. I know that that will have a positive impact on, on our revenue share, uh, but I don't know the exact formula that they, they run that through. Stacy Martin, who is a very talented uh, young lady, is sure our is. senior associate AD for finance, and, and Stacy uh, is in those conversations uh, with her counterparts, and so she at the conference office, and she knows. Uh, Tom knows. Um, I, I don't know that exact formula, so I'm not able to give but you But needless answer. to say, it'll be a, a nice chunk that you probably didn't expect going in until you became an official member of the American, knowing that there was still the one year with the BCS. Yes, so that's it can't correct. Hurt. It can't, it, no, it doesn't <laughs> hurt at all, and all those teams getting to go to bowls will be helpful. Ren, we like to uh, end all our interviews with something we call Five for the Road. So all I need is quick answers to these questions so people can learn a little bit more about you, maybe away from the job, away from your responsibilities on a daily basis. First question for you is, what is your favorite professional sports team in, in any sport? Atlanta Braves. Yeah, and what's the connection? Um, growing up, the Braves were on TBS. The, the Cubs Super were Station. on WGN. You know, I'm 35 years old, so that was my brother and I. He loves the Cubs. I love the Braves, and, and uh, we fought that battle growing up. So. <laughs> How about your favorite professional athlete of all time? Uh, I'm a big fan of John Stockton. Uh, I loved how selfless he was. I loved his toughness and his tenacity uh, on the floor. I was a huge uh, jazz fan while he was there. Not so much now, but I used to watch every game they played because I loved the way that he ran the team. Yeah, not a, little, not a bad little combination, Stockton and Malone. What's your favorite music? What do you like to listen to? Um, you know, now I've kind of grown into a country music fan. I grew up in rural southeastern Oklahoma, a town there of a thousand. Go. I live 20 miles from town. Um, and then, you know, for a long time, I liked hip-hop and R&B and still do to a certain degree. My wife and I laughed because when we got together, she did not like hip-hop and, and R&B. Now that's what she listens to. And I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of a country uh, music, uh, even old country George Jones, Merle mm -hmm. Haggard kind of guy. And isn't Garth Brooks from Oklahoma? He is. Yeah. In fact, you know, he just announced he's going to tour again. And I've already got, he's got some Oklahoma State connections. He's a graduate of there. And I've already called some buddies at Oklahoma State saying, hey, I don't care what it costs. I need good seats for Garth. Use those connections. Favorite movie of all time? Um, you know, I don't know that I have a favorite of, uh, of all time. Uh, Give me one. We're short on time, yeah, man. I'm putting I, you on the I, pressure. You know, Jerry Maguire is a great movie. Jerry I've McGuire? probably seen that 50 times. So. <laughs> 50 times. Yeah. Finally, a favorite TV show. What do you like to watch? What's, uh, what's your guilty pleasure? I, I'm a big fan of all of the CSIs. My wife uh, and I watch a lot of those. You know, we don't, you know, probably should watch something more happy, but I've become a fan of Dora. I got a two and a half year old daughter. There so, you go. Yeah. Perfect for, yeah. but you're going to be watching a lot of TV when you watch all those CSIs. There's only about 20 of them. Right? That's exactly right. Hey, Ren, an absolute pleasure. Hey, thank you, Greg. Thank Appreciate you so much it. for joining yeah, us. Thank you. We'll take a short break. When we come back, it's overtime.
Earlier this month, the Memphis Amateur Sports Hall of Fame welcomed 14 new members. Ceremonies for the 44th annual event were held at the Memphis Hilton, and among the inductees was golfer Barry Stafford, boxers Edgar Buffalo and Frank House, and game official Don DeWeese. Yes, the same Don DeWeese who you may better know for being the proprietor of Gibson's Donuts. On the special night, there were also two additional honorees that need to be singled out. Our good friend J.J. Ganazzo, who was inducted for his personal contribution. J.J. is in his 50th season as an official scorer, and among his many career highlights, he is the founder of the Commercial Appeals Best of Preps. Also, the great Larry Finch was posthumously given the Hall's Lifetime Achievement Award for his prowess on the court as one of the greatest round ballers to ever grace the Memphis hardwood, both as a prep at Melrose High and during his college days at Memphis, in addition to being the all-time winningest head coach in the history of the University of Memphis. Photographer Kurt Rare was at the event and filed this report. Vicki, the Hall of Fame is honored to present you and your family a Lifetime Achievement Award in Larry Finch's honor. Uh, this award was very special to me because uh, Larry has always shared his life with uh, people and for them to remember him and he's still sharing. Uh, he loved the community, he loved the people and for this organization to think so much as to name an um, award after Larry is just really, really special to me and I'm sure he would have just been totally honored that they thought enough of him to still name something like that after him. Your love of the game, as well as your tremendous knowledge, the places, places you at the very top of your profession. And as such, you are certainly Hall of Fame worthy. We certainly agree. Please welcome John Benozo. To be honored by all these people tonight that you worked with and played with and everything, and then to step in where the former recipients, that just remarkable, I mean, unbelievable. Uh, uh, I'm honored, uh, humbled, you know, all those adjectives, but you really are when you see people like Vicki Finch with Larry Finch and George Moreland's uh, wife getting an award and, and all those people, it was just, just a wonderful experience. Elmer Ray, who's in this Hall of Fame, gave me a school book one day and said, you're it. I had to go to town to buy a, school, a rule book, and ever, ever since then, it's been history, 6,000 games, but probably the, good, the best thing I can remember is just, just working with all the young people, doing best of the preps, doing high school baseball, college baseball, uh, you know, and then being recognized by the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Uh, that, that was uh, an experience, too. The senior vice president, Bill Hasley, uh, this year sent me a very nice uh, letter, commendation, recognizing me for my work with American Collegiate Baseball and, and amateur baseball and professional baseball and said I would have been first ballot inductee. Tell me why Amateur Sports Hall of Fame is important. Well, amateur sports is a pure sports. You don't get paid. Most of the coaches in amateur sports are volunteers. High school sports are basically the same thing. You play for the fun of it and most of the athletes, uh, all of the athletes, they play with heart and determination instead of for money and you know, it's, 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 I, mean, I just love amateur sports. And congrats to all the new members of the Memphis Amateur Sports Hall of Fame. Okay, several things I need to point out before we wrap things up. First, the Memphis Tigers football team closed out the season last Saturday by dropping a 45-10 decision at Connecticut. The Tigers finished 3-9 and lost their last two games by a combined 86-31 margin. In the meantime, the Memphis Hoop team has won five straight heading into tonight's game against Arkansas Little Rock. On Tuesday, the Tigers will return to the national spotlight when they face Florida in the Jimmy V Classic at Madison Square Garden in New York City. And the Grizzlies are in New Orleans tonight and will return home to face Minnesota on Sunday and the Lakers Tuesday night. The Grizzlies continue to get rocked by injury as Quincy Pondexter became the latest casualty. Coupon has a stress fracture in his right foot that will keep him out the rest of the season. 
The team is currently dealing with Marcus Gasol sprained MCL and at various times this season have lost Tony Allen, Zach Randolph, Ed Davis and Jared Bayless to injury. And that'll do it for the show. Remember to see any of our previous offerings. Simply head to our website WKNO.org and click on KNO tonight. Next week, we're back on in our usual Thursday, 8.30 p.m. time slot. So until then, have a great week, and we'll see you next time.